Good evening, everyone. I am Vidansh Parikh, interning with the Nature's Eye, and I welcome you all for the Wildlife Conservation Webinar. Before we proceed, I would like to introduce my team members present here, Taku, Shiuli, Maria, and Tikili. The Nature's Eye, powered by Wildlife Arc, is a group of nature enthusiasts who wish to share their knowledge and experience with the world. We strive to bring informative and education content from the tiny living natural world to the city dwellers like us here. Our motto is to empower environmentalists by creating opportunities not only for budding environmentalists, but also for the people related to this, to this field and the ones who want to join in through our various offline and online programs. The Nature's Eye is working on bridging ecology and economy. We enjoy working with nature enthusiasts who wish to bring change by spreading education and awareness. This webinar is one such attempt within the training and internship program which we are a part of. And there are a number of such events in the line as well, and you must check them out on our website. Now, finally, coming towards today's event, we have to hurry a bit because we are a bit late. We have um, among with us Dr. Prantik Hazra. A bit something about him. He is an assistant professor in zoology at Darjeeling Government College. And just like us present here, Dr. Hazra is passionate about his research interests in behavioral and e community ecology impact of global warming and climate change on biodiversity and conservation biology. Before I hand over the session to, the, to our speaker, I request all the participants to keep themselves muted. If you have any queries, please type it in the chat box down below. We will take it up in the end at the Q&A session. And very important, at the end, we have a sweet little gift for you all, so stay tuned till the end. Thank you once again, and over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, am I audible? Hello? Yes, you're audible, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you very much to all the uh, members of the Nature Side. At the same time, uh, thank you uh, to all the participants. So it's an uh, immense opportunity for me to represent uh, myself and uh, I think a, a few of my words also, okay, here in uh, front of the audience. Anyway, so I'm uh, extremely sorry for uh, that uh, network issues. Actually, uh, in Darjeeling, uh, there are some problems okay, uh, of uh, network and uh, especially uh, from afternoon onwards due to the dense fog, uh, I think the networks are not working properly anyway. So without wasting time, already we are late. Uh, so without wasting time, I'm uh, starting my conversation. Please uh, go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, the what is the meaning of wildlife conservation? So according to Wildlife uh, Protection Act 1972 of uh, India, so wildlife, it can be defined as a uh, various uh, flora and fauna of a particular region collectively. That is uh, better to say that is uh, all types of non-domesticated animals and plants and other organisms uh, that are present into the wild areas. Okay, so together they can uh, be considered as a wildlife. And wildlife conservation is an activity in which uh, humans make a uh, conscious effort to protect plants and other animal species and uh, their habitats. Now, uh, before proceeding this, uh, we have to, uh, although in uh, India and uh, there are also a few other countries that we have a long green tradition of, uh, I think, uh, of conserving the nature and uh, you can say there is the wildlife also. But the modern movement and modern laws actually uh, that has been uh, started in uh, USA and a uh, few other countries. So before uh, going in much detail, we, ha we have to, uh, we are just uh, focusing on uh, some of the, I think uh, the historical uh, people and the historical events and the acts uh, that actually uh, uh, play a great role in the wildlife conservation. Please uh, go to the next slide. So first, that is the Morals Act of uh, 1962. Okay, that is, uh, it made land grant universities first. Okay, that is a uh, uh, few uh, areas, okay, that must be uh, protected or that must be, uh, I think, uh, uh, regulated by some authorities. Now, uh, after that, uh, go to the next slide. After that, what we have seen, that is, uh, just uh, about uh, 10 years uh, after, okay, that is the 
Yellowstone National Park. It is the first national park in the world. Okay. So it's uh, proposed uh, was the preserve and the natural resource of the area. It was established in 1972 and about uh, 3472 uh, square miles in uh, area, uh, situated in the Montana and Wyoming in uh, USA. Uh, please go to the next slide. The National Park Services, it was also uh, enacted in USA in 1961, and uh, the other federal agencies were responsible for the care of these national parks. There is also a Lacey Act, okay, which was uh, enacted in 1900 and also amended in 1981. Uh, prior that actually, that is the regulation of the treatment of the illegally killed animals. So uh, we can see that is uh, uh, from uh, 19th and at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, some initiatives has been started to conserve the wildlife. Next, please. Now the Migratory Bird Conservation Act, it is first uh, step in protecting migratory birds in 1929. And uh, it also requires uh, people for planning on hunting and migratory birds and uh, to purchase, uh, they have to purchase special stamps uh, for hunting of the migratory birds. And that was enacted in 1937. And that is the initial uh, attempt to regulate the uh, rampant killing of the migratory birds. Uh, next, please. Then we see that is the Pigment Robertson Act. There is money in the form of taxes on hunting equipment and ammunition. It was enacted in 1937 again. So uh, for uh, hunting equipment and the, suppose the hunting guns and uh, the other equipment for the hunting, if you, if anyone want to purchase at that time, from that time, they have to pay some taxes for it. Uh, next, please. Now wildlife refugee system. It is a part of the US Fish and Wildlife Service enacted in 1966. That is a system of wildlife refugee across the United States. And uh, it was started from 1966. Uh, next, please. Then again in USA, that is the Endangered uh, Species Act. And that is uh, 1973. It identifies and uh, manages rare and threatened and endangered species. Excuse me. Sir, you Sorry. may continue. Okay. Uh, next, please. Now the John Oduban. Okay. That is the he watched and studied birds and uh, published uh, books on the bird studies. Okay. And in uh, after his uh, about uh, more than fifty years of his death, that is the uh, nineteen hundred and five, the National Oduban Society, it was formed. Next. That is the father of conservation movement. That is the US president, that is the Theodore Roosevelt. Okay, he passed legislations to help protect the natural resources. Next. Then the Aldo Leopold, that is the first uh, person, okay, that is the who applied ecology to the wildlife. And he also wrote a book on the game management. Okay, that is the how to manage the Game animals. Next, please. The Hodge Bennett, that is the father of soil conservation. Okay, today soil conservation is a big issue throughout the globe, and uh, especially in the developing and uh, underdeveloped countries. And uh, it was uh, started uh, by the Hodge Bennett, and then the J. Darling, actually who uh, made the conservation or conservation efforts uh, quite popular worldwide. Okay through his uh, migratory bird stamps and uh, the cartoons. Uh, next, please. So these are the work of the J. Darling, okay. And uh, one great statement of the J. Darling is that, that is the land, water, vegetation are just, that dependent on one another. Without these three primary elements in natural balance, we can have neither fish nor game, wildflowers nor trees, labor nor capital, nor sustaining habitat for humans. So 
several decades back, he realized that. And he expressed uh, many things in his cartoon. I can show also a few cartoons of him. Uh, please, uh, the next slide. So these are the work by the Jay Darling through uh, the cartoons. He actually tried to award the people okay, regarding the conservation of the wildlife and the natural habitat. Next. Now, one of the most uh, famous person in uh, the conservation biology, that is the Rachel Carson. Okay, in his book, Silent uh, Spring, he uh, actually created worldwide awareness of the degree of the environmental pollution. Okay, so today we are quite con quite concerned about that. I, I think at least most of the people they are quite concerned about the environmental pollutions. But actually, uh, the worldwide awareness it was uh, actually uh, I mean, we can if we say that is the who is uh, responsible for that type of awareness worldwide. Rachel Carson he is the she is the person. Next, now come to India. In modern era also, there are many movements have been started in India and uh, they also have some, uh, I think uh, that is uh, a fruitful result. So that is by Sundar Lal Bahuguna, that is the Chipko movements. Okay, that is the people they, in the figure we have seen, they actually uh, stuck with the trunk of the trees and they prevent uh, the authorities to cut down the trees. Next. Then uh, that is the Narmada Baja Andalon. That is the Medha Patekar and uh, Baba Amte, they are the pioneer of that. And uh, what is that? Uh, that is actually the Narmada Baja Andalon is the most powerful mass movement started in 1985 against the construction of the huge dam on the Narmada River. Usually if, uh, as we know, that is the, if there is a huge dam is, uh, if it is uh, created, then in the upstream of the river, a huge area is actually submerged under uh, water. So I think uh, uh, the movement has been uh, spread uh, uh, and uh, actually the native uh, tribal people, the Adivashis, the farmers, environmentalists, and uh, human rights activists, they stood against this. Uh, please, uh, next slide. Now the five basic values of the wildlife. That is the first of all. That is the aesthetic value. That is the enjoying of wildlife, uh, beauty, and pleasure. Of course, uh, that can uh, create a very good impression on our mind, and also helps to, uh, I think, uh, improve our uh, mental health. Also, there are many scientific values. That is the studying and research on wildlife for their use in medicine. Okay, integrated uh, pest management, etc. There are also many ecological values. Okay. That is their values in their uh, nature and uh, communities and also the game value. Uh, in uh, many countries actually, especially in uh, North American and uh, African countries, uh, they actually uh, invite the people for, uh, I think, uh, hunting. Hunting, it is the permitted hunting, not illegal hunting. In that case, uh, people have to de deposit a large amount of uh, money and uh, they can go and suppose in Africa, they can hunt a lion or a elephant or a buffalo. And the money that the deposit actually used for the conservation. Okay. So please, uh, next slide. Now the direct uh, use value, that is the food, then building materials, then fuel, paper products, fiber, industrial products, medicine. I think most of the products, uh, I, I think we are, we are actually getting from the uh, uh, natural resources. Okay. And especially, uh, next slide, please. Uh, please uh, go to the next slide. Food, uh, actually today, most of the people rely on 20 types of plants and only three to four sustainable crops, whatever it may be, but diversity is critical for developing new strains and breeds. Okay, so, uh, even uh, I can give, in, uh, give an example. I think most probably we know it very well that uh, the uh, uh, that is the table bread. Okay, there is a bread or wheat. Okay, that we take. It is actually uh, I think uh, worldwide. I think most of the people they, they take the wheat and rice, etc. Now, if we come to the wheat, that is the its scientific name is Triticum estivum. So the wheat actually it is the product of three wild grasses. So even today, the uh, I think the enrichment of the variety of the wheats, okay, 
that is uh, not only the crossbreeding of different wheat varieties, but also sometimes uh, crossbreeding between uh, the wild varieties has done. So, alongside our uh, normal cultivation, we also have to maintain the natural wild ecosystem because uh, there may be some varieties or some very closely related species may be there. If we cross the particular crops, okay, with the wild variety, maybe, or it is not maybe, I think in many cases it has been seen that it's uh, it actually uh, uh, produces the hybrid vigor. That is the, uh, the hybrid uh, variety become more productive. The hybrid variety become more resistant to pest. The hybrid variety may consume less amount of water. And as uh, in uh, many parts of the uh, India, including many parts of the world, the water scarcity it is increasing. So I think uh, that is the only way by means of which uh, we can uh, rely on the, or we can depend on the uh, agricultural system that uh, can, I think, uh, uh, that actually uh, require less amount of water. So day by day, I think as the water crisis increases, so day by day, we, we will be, we, we have to need, or, or we uh, or we'll need the particular varieties of the crops that can grow in less amount of water. And uh, in that case, production of the biodiversity as well as uh, biodiversity that is the wildlife or the natural habitat is very much crucial. Because only from the, if you, you can say about the genetic engineering or whatever it may be, but from where we will get the where valuable get genes? The... But from where we will get the valuable genes? But from where okay. we will get the valuable genes? Okay. Hello. So Hello. in that case, so, so in that case, someone is unmuted. Please mute yourself. That is why Sir's voice is echoing. So, uh, so the wild uh, varieties are uh, quite uh, important because uh, they are actually uh, the, or the because they can be used okay for the hybrid vigor that is the hybrid we can produce the hybrid varieties of crops that require uh, less amount of water for production at the same time uh, they may be uh, resistant to paste and uh, they may be more productive. Now next, that is the industrial products. Okay, there are only few it is mentioned here, although there are so many others are there. Okay, so so many industrial products are there that are actually, uh, uh, we can get from the uh, wild or uh, from the natural habitats. And there are many traditional medicines. Okay, that is the basis of uh, many drugs, including the, that is the anti-cancer drug, Taxol. And uh, the Taxol actually, it is uh, known uh, for its uh, efficiency to cure the breast uterine or uh, ovarian cancer. And actually it uh, prevents the depolymerization of the uh, microtubules by the kinetochore. So that's a technical term anyway. So basically they are used against the breast uh, uterine or ovarian cancers. And also the vincristin and vinblastin, that is uh, from uh, Catharanthus roseus, that is the, also known as the vinca rosea. Okay, it is also found in the plains. Most of the plains of the India it is found and uh, they are widely used uh, for the treatment of the leukemia. There are also many other indirect uh, benefits from, the conservation, from conserving the wildlife. First of all, it is regulating the global processes such as the atmosphere and climate, then soil and water conservation, and also the nutrient uh, recycling, pollination, seed dispersal, control of agricultural paste, and also uh, creating the genetic library, the inspiring uh, and uh, the information, the scientific and educational purpose, tourism and recreation, the cultural, spiritual, and some, uh, there are also many aesthetic values, the community resilience, and also some strategic importance are there. Now I am going to some specific, uh, that is the geological uh, organisms or the animals that can be used as a drug. 
that is a cinnamon and uh, coarse rains, they produce the toxins that could uh, treat uh, autoimmune disease like the arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. And even the hemotoxins in the snake venom, they can be used for medicine. Uh, sir, such should as I, uh, heart attack. Sorry, sir, for interrupting. Should I change the slide? Yes, 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 please. Yes, uh, next. Uh, next. Yes. So there are some animal toxins uh, that can be used as uh, potential drugs. Okay, that is the cinnamon and the coarse strains. They produce toxins uh, that could uh, treat uh, autoimmune diseases like the arthritis, multiple sclerosis, and systemic uh, lupus erythematosus. Uh, please go to the next slide. Then the hemotoxins in snake venom uh, that can be used uh, for medicines, such as uh, treating the heart attack and the blood disorders, and uh, other drugs uh, that has been developed from the neurotoxin in the snake venom, which are used in the treat of the Alzheimer and the Parkinson disease. Okay, uh, as well as uh, can be fit for the for some brain injuries. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, that is the Model Life. It's a pharmaceutical company. It produced a drug called Escozine, whose sole active ingredient is blue scorpion venom. Okay. So, Model Life said that Escozine is an effective cancer treatment because a peptide in the venom called chlorotoxin, the same chemical that paralyzes the prey, it, can, it also happens to target and kill the cancer cells. So already it is, it is uh, available in the market. So even there are many, uh, I think uh, other animals are also there from which we can get some potential drugs. Please go to, go to the next slide. The cobra venom has been used to treat uh, joint pain, inflammation and arthritis in Ayurveda and uh, that is an Indian traditional medicine. B venom has been used to treat the chronic inflammation, the skin disease, and uh, pain relief for thousands of years. Uh, next slide, please. So wild, wildlife conservation. So the conservation biology, actually, it, uh, the, it is the several other sectors are actually connected with it. Okay, like the basic biological science, that is the biology, geology, botany, and uh, ecology and applied uh, management uh, science like the wildlife, forestry, and uh, the range fisheries, and also the physical environment like the geographic, chemistry, geology, physics, the social environment, as well as the implementation environment like the law, the planning, the education, engineering, etc. So the conservation biology is actually connected with uh, almost everything. So please, uh, next slide. Now there are four parts in the wildlife conservation. So first of all, that is the education, that is the learning how to conserve wildlife and its resources. Then research using science to better understand and uh, need and uh, requirements of the wildlife and its habitat. Then the law enforcement, that is the ensure that all laws related to the wildlife uh, are followed. At the same time, the wildlife management, that is the manipulation of the wildlife to achieve a positive goal. Please uh, go to the next slide. Then there is an in-situ and ex-situ conservation. We know that is the conservation in, a, in their natural habitat. It is the in-situ, okay. And ex-situ, that is the conservation in Jew Botanical Garden, as well as the, that is the seed bank. So in-situ conservation, uh, next slide, please. So it is the setting up wildlife reserves, okay. It's not just a matter of uh, building a fence around the area and letting it grow wild, but uh, if we allow, yeah, here I think two, two figures are there. So if we allow the, or if we lift the land, okay, uh, without uh, any intervention, then what will happen? That is the, without raising animals, there the natural plants, 
okay they can easily grow and the other animals that is the mainly say the wild animals they will start to visit that area next slide now according to iucn there are so many categories that are there now category 1 that is the strict nature reserve uh, that is the the bargosin range okay it is one of the oldest uh, nature reserve in russia and it is situated uh, beside the lake boikal uh, next slide please now category 1b that is the wilderness area that is a protected area managed uh, mainly for wilderness protection here we have seen that is the stephen mather wilderness forest in the us state of washington and uh, then please go to the next slide category 2 that is the national park that is a protected area managed uh, mainly for the ecosystem protection and uh, recreation a uh, very good example it is the jim corbett national park it is the first national park in india and uh, there are also another 106 national parks throughout india next slide please wildlife sanctuaries uh, they are also uh, under category 2 uh, protected area under iucn and uh, there are in our in, in india there are about 553 there is a 553 wildlife sanctuaries and uh, the oldest uh, bird sanctuary in India, it is the Vedantangal Bird Sanctuary near Chennai. It was established in uh, 1796. Next slide. So uh, national uh, parks, there are about, uh, there is a proposed and expansion of the protected area network. The national parks up to 163 right now it has become 175 our target is to uh, i think uh, um, uh, to uh, create at least 175 national parks right now and uh, it constitutes more than 1.67 percent of the land while to increase the wildlife sanctuaries up to 707 and uh, that will comprise about 8.7 percent of the geographic area of our country Next slide, please. Please mute yourself. Whosoever is unmuted, please mute yourself. Now, category three, that is the natural monument. That is the protected area. It managed mainly for conserving of specific uh, natural features. That is the Conodo Arita, that is a natural monument in Argentina. Next slide, please. Now, category four, that is the habitat or species uh, management area. That is a protected area managed mainly for the conserving through management intervention. Uh, next slide. So, in category five, there are some protected uh, landscape or uh, seascape. Here we can see that is the Happy Island Seascape in Philippines. Next. Now it is a category six, that is a managed resource protected area. That is a protected area managed mainly for the sustainable use of the natural ecosystem. Uh, uh, example is the Lagoon House of the, in Greece. Next slide, please. Now the biodiversity hotspot. Now, the biodiversity hotspot, what spot, why actually biodiversity hotspots are uh, required? Because there are two criteria. If it contains 1,500 species of vascular endemic plant, and if it already lost 17% of its primary native vegetation, that is its natural habitat, okay? In that case, that area can be considered as biodiversity hotspot. So there are 36 biodiversity hotspots are there. And uh, in uh, India, there are, India actually there are pro two prominent uh, biodiversity hotspots. We also share a hotspot, that is the Indo-Burma hotspot, along with uh, other countries uh, like the Myanmar, China, and uh, the Bangladesh also. Next slide, please. Now the Western Ghat. Okay, there is a Western Ghat complex that is a biodiversity hotspot and several endemic species are also there. 
for example, that is the Nilgiri Thor and the lion tailed macaque. Next slide, please. And also the North Sea Stimuli, another biodiversity hotspot, which is situated uh, mainly within the India. And uh, these are the, that is the hispid here, the golden langur and pygmy hog. These are the endemic species here. Next uh, slide, please. Now, that is the biodiversity reserve. What are the criteria? A site that must contain an effectively protected and minimally disturbed core area of value of the nature conservation. The core area should be typical of a biogeographical unit and large enough to sustain viable populations representing all tropic levels in the ecosystem. Okay. The management authority to ensure the involvement and cooperation of the local communities to bring the variety of the knowledge and experience to link biodiversity conservation and socioeconomic uh, development while managing and containing the conflict. So in the biosphere reserve, actually uh, what happens, of course there is a code area and also of course there is a buffer zone, but uh, uh, I think uh, there is the exploitation of uh, natural resources in few selected areas are also allowed. So these are the biosphere reserves in India. Uh, next slide, please. Now, what are the advantages of the in situ conservation? First, the species will have all the resource that it is adapted to, means it is uh, growing in its natural habitat. Then the species will continue to evolve in their environment. Next, the species will have more space, okay? They have a bigger breeding area, okay? At the same time, it is cheaper to keep an organism in, it, in its natural habitat. And most uh, importantly, the evolution operating with them or operating on the species and ultimately uh, the species can be adopted in the changing envi environment. That is the one of the main advantage of the in situ conservation. While there are some uh, problems are there, that is it is difficult to control uh, illegal exploitation, for example, poaching, and the environment may need, uh, that is uh, restoring the alien species, okay, that are uh, difficult to control also. Because uh, for the in situ conservation, please go to the next slide. So to manage a large area, there are some problems. What are the problems? The problems are there are actually that uh, in that case, huge amount, I think huge uh, amount of money at the same time manpower is required to protect uh, the particular habitat or particular area. So uh, it is uh, first of all, a large amount of manpower is required at the same time, huge amount of money is also required. Please go to the next slide. Now the exit to conservation, that is the captive breeding, the Hawaiian goose, it was uh, extinct and uh, became extinct and uh, 12 birds, it, it was actually in the captive uh, breeding program, but uh, actually ultimately it was uh, failed to reintroduce because the rats that eat the egg and the, uh, that is the nestling of the geese, okay, that are actually not eradicated. Please go to the next slide. So uh, there is an, another thing, another example, that is the Perry Davis deer. And uh, it was native to China, but uh, became extinct uh, in the mainland China, in the, in the China, that is their native habitat. And uh, there are some uh, collection in some uh, collection in some Jews. And in 1981, there are about 994 individuals. But uh, I think uh, till date, uh, there is no uh, initiatives has been, uh, uh, or we I cannot get any great success to reintroduce it. Please go to the next slide. Now, that is the Californian condor. Okay, this is a success story of the reintroduction and captive breeding. Uh, once it was, uh, that is, uh, extinct in the, into the wild, but uh, then the captive breeding has been started and uh, it was uh, 
reintroduced in several uh, places of uh, USA as well as in the Mexico. And in 2003 onwards, uh, it has been seen that uh, it is uh, it, uh, it has been started breeding uh, into the wild. Now, next slide, yes. Now, ex situ conservation, that is the captivity is uh, of endangered species is the last resort, but there are uh, so many other uh, problems with the ex situ conservations. Because here we have a handful of uh, orga organisms or handful of uh, individuals. So there is a huge chance of the inbreeding and uh, the product or the next generation will suffer from the inbreeding depression. And uh, that has been also, also occurred or that has been also seen in the nature also, where the number of uh, individual is very low, especially in the North America, it is that it is observed in case of the prairie chicken, that is the Timanucus cupido. Then what scientists did, they actually capture a few uh, prairie chicken from one place and release them into another place. In that case, that is the, in, uh, the crossbreeding between, between different uh, populations has been started. And ultimately they get some success. But in case of ex situ conservation, it's very difficult because only we have some uh, limited uh, animals. And, the, and if the limited animals are present in different zoos, then the exchange of, that is, uh, animals or exchange of uh, uh, other organisms can be done, okay, between different zoos or different uh, botanical gardens. But if there is a single zoo or single botanical garden that contains a uh, particular species, suppose there are 10 or 20 or 100 uh, individuals, and if the species is extinct into the wild, in that case, <laughs> there is no other way to uh, start uh, breeding within these 10 or 100 individuals. So in that case, uh, massive inbreeding depression uh, may appear there. Next slide, please. So that's why Jew is uh, known as the land of the living dead. Uh, next slide, please. Similarly, in case of the botanical garden also. Next slide, that is the seed bank. Okay. In seed bank, the seed of different uh, plants that can be preserved less than 5% 5, 5 humidity and at uh, minus 20 degrees centigrade. So again, it is the last uh, resort to uh, conserve a particular species of plants. And uh, also there are many uh, drawbacks of seed banks. Okay, if uh, by chance uh, the humidity is not maintained properly, okay. In that case, the seed can be uh, infected with fungus or bacteria. So, Although this is the last resort, but there are so many uh, problems with the seed banks to uh, conserve a species for a long time. Next slide, please. Now there are many international agencies that are working with the conservation. First one that is the sites, that is the Convention in uh, International Trade in Endangered Species. It was set up in uh, 1988 uh, to control uh, and encourage the sustainable exploitation of the species. And there are several appendices and the species are listed in several appendices. Please go to the next slide. The appendix one, that is the total ban of exploitation. That is the, all the endangered, critically endangered, and uh, I think uh, most of the a vulnerable species also, they are actually uh, banned for, uh, I think, uh, for uh, any type of uh, their trade, okay, whether living or any part of the particular species. Then Appendix 2, there is a limited exploitation subject to quotas, okay, means, uh, suppose uh, I can take an example of the American black beer, uh, they are uh, that is uh, hunting of the American black bear. Sometimes it is uh, allowed, okay, in a particular season of the of a year. And uh, after that, uh, especially during their breeding season, uh, the hunting is really, the huntings are stopped legally. So, so limited exploitations are actually allowed for those animals. 
next into the appendix three. Next slide, please. So that is the species requiring protection in certain states only. Suppose the that is the African civet. Okay, its uh, trade is uh, banned in Botswana, but maybe some other countries uh, their uh, trade is allowed. Next slide, please. Now the WWF, that is the Worldwide Fauna for Nature. And uh, that, is the, that is set up in 1961. It is a non-governmental organization and it raises funds for the conservation. And uh, it also raises the awareness on the conservation issues. And the uh, Project Tiger that was uh, launched in India. It was a joint venture of the WWF and the government of India. Please go to the next slide. So now the mega diversity countries. Okay, the country contains as much as 78% of the world species. Uh, sorry, there is a typological mistake. Actually, there that will be the 17 mega diversity countries are there. And these are the India, Brazil, Equator, United States, and uh, so on. Please uh, go to the next slide. Now, why India, now come to India, why India has a rich biological diversity? Since India lies at the confluence of the African, European, and Indo-Malayan region, the biota therefore include African, European, Eurasian, Mediterranean climate, which together with Indian endemic elements contribute to the richness of the characteristic Indian biodiversity. Next slide. Uh, now there are many biogeographic diversity. There is Trans Himalayan region and the Himalayan region, the Indian desert is there. That is the Thor desert. There are many semi-arid zones in Gujarat and Rajasthan also. There is Western Ghat, the Deccan Peninsula, the Gangetic Plains and the Northeast uh, Islands and sorry, Northeast uh, India and the islands, the Andaman and Nicobar Island where we can find different types of uh, endemic species. Okay like the Andaman teal, like Nito or Pigeon. Then diverse habitat and ecosystem. There is a tropical rainforest to alpine vegetation. There is temperate forest to coastal region also, or uh, mangrove forest is also there. World's largest mangrove, we know it is situated in uh, uh, our country, that is the Sundarbon. There is also semi-arid to arid region as well as there are plains to Himalayas to islands. So that's why there is a huge uh, varieties of the habitats and ecosystems are there. That's why actually India has become a mega diversity country. Next slide, please. There are many other important things like the physiography of India, the variety of uh, elevation and the local climate, it also varies from area to area and also the wetlands. India has a large, uh, rich variety of the wetlands, including the freshwater to brackishwater wetlands. We know Chilka, okay, it's a brackishwater wetland, while there are many freshwater wetlands are also there, even in the high altitude wetlands that are present in uh, Jammu and Kashmir, as well as in Sikkim, as, and uh, also in the Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, next slide, please. There are uh, forests from uh, moist to dry deciduous forest and uh, the thorn forests and several upper, other types of forest uh, and other types of vegetations are also there. At the same time, there is also marine environment, which is a rich fishing ground also. Please go to the next. Now the status of the total diversity of Indian fauna. So here we can get, that is the total there is, there is more than 91,000 and uh, in comparable to the world, uh, India, it has actually 7.43% of the diversity of fauna are present in India. Next slide, please. Now the endemic species that India has many endemic uh, vertebrate species and uh, there is a list. And uh, here we have seen there are uh, so many endemic species are there. There's in uh, 638 species of the 
mammals that are endemic, 69 species of the birds are there that are endemic, and so on. Uh, next slide. There are many World Heritage Sites in India. Even uh, the national parks and wildlife sanctuaries, they are also known as the uh, wildlife heritage. That is the Kajiranga National Park, Manas, both are situated in Assam. At the same time, Keladev and Ghana National Park, Rajasthan, the Sundarban National Park in West Bengal, and Nanda Devi National Park in Uttaranchal. Next slide, please. Now the Ramsar Convention. There is an intergovernmental treaty on the wetland conservation. Now, why do the wetland conservation is quite important? Because freshwater ecosystem or freshwater wetlands or freshwater ecosystem, it is the most threatened globally. And there are 75 wetlands in India that have been identified at the Ramsar site. Now, please go to the next slide. So if we see the trends of, uh, that is the, decline or the trends of decline of the where that is the freshwater uh, ecosystem marine ecosystem and terrestrial ecosystem we have seen we can see that is the from 1970 onwards that is a major decline in the freshwater ecosystem so that's why the production of the wetlands mainly the freshwater uh, wetlands is the is crucial because they are the most threatened ecosystem throughout the globe uh, please uh, go to the next slide. Now there are many uh, criterion of the Ramsar uh, wetlands. I'm not going much detail. There are nine criterion at there. So please uh, go to the next slide. Yes. Now I can uh, start the uh, study side. Okay. So. Uh, we have studied uh, for a long time in the Bokrasa Reservoir. It is situated in Birhum district in West Bengal, uh, India. And uh, a large dam is erected about 6.38 square kilometer, not very large, but comparatively larger. So in the Bokrasa River. So it is an artificially created or man-made uh, dam. Uh, please go to the next slide. Uh, it is the satellite imagery of the dam is like that. But here, three species we have found that can meet the criterion five of that or Ramsar criteria. Okay, please go to the next slide. So here we have seen that is the rudy cell duck. It's actually a population of individuals with 1% threshold. 1% threshold means that is the 1% of the global population. So according to the fifth, criteria, fifth Ramsar criteria, if any wetland supports any wild bird species or any um, uh, aquatic bird species whose uh, population exceed 1% for more than three years, then the wetland can be considered as a wetland of global importance. That is, that can be declared as a Ramsar site. So here, the one person level of the Rudy cell duck, it is uh, 500. And uh, from 2005 onwards, we have observed that the bird is still visiting and uh, their number is always uh, above 600, sometimes above 700. Please go to the next slide. Again, in case of gray, gray like goose, their uh, threshold level or 1% of the global population is uh, just 150, but from 2007 onwards, we have seen the number usually varies from uh, 250 to uh, 380. So that also indicates that the Bokhtasar Reservoir can be declared as a Ramsar site. Please uh, go to the next slide. Again, in case of bar-headed goose, is uh, threshold level or 1% of global population is 560. So since 2011, we have seen more than 800 birds, they are regularly visiting the wetland. And we also uh, send uh, the data and uh, our, uh, our proposal okay, to the Ministry of Forest and Environment uh, if uh, it is possible to declare the wetland as a Ramsar site. Next slide. 
next slide please so these are the list of uh, ramsar sites in india next slide please so there are also i, I think uh, under scanner that is the these uh, lakes uh, soon i think in future they may be declared as a ramsar site that is the lali sanctuary in Arunachal Pradesh, Kabartal in Bihar, the Pulikot Lake in Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh, and also in Andaman and Nicobar Island. Please, next slide. So now we are uh, just uh, discussing a very uh, a brief uh, regarding our Wildlife Protection Act, and especially there are different schedules. The schedule one, it actually leads all the endangered or critically endangered or rare species, while schedule two, it includes the uh, game species, while schedule three and four, it comprises uh, most of the small games, while schedule five, it uh, constitutes some uh, varmints uh, like uh, um, uh, porcupine or uh, there is a rabbit and some common crow, fruit, bats, mice, rats. Please go to the next slide. Now these are the IUCN categories of the threatened species. Among these, there is the extinct and extinct in the extinct means they are totally gone. Okay, there is uh, no scope to revival. Extinct in the wild means there are some, uh, I think, uh, uh, hope is there. That is the still, they may be present into the geological garden or in the botanical garden. Then critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. Okay, these are the major threatened categories. Please go to the next slide. Now extinct, they are totally extinct. Okay, both in captive and in the wild. That is the passenger pigeon in, uh, uh, that is the North America. Next. Then extinct in the wild already we have discussed. There is the Perry David's deer. Okay, it is uh, extinct in the wild, but it is uh, several uh, individuals are present in different Jews, but uh, uh, there is not yet any successful uh, reintroduction has been done. Next. Critically endangered means they are the extremely high risk of extinction. For example, the great Indian bustard, it's a uh, wild, I think the global population is hardly 250. It is hardly 250. So uh, it's, uh, if we don't take any uh, proper action immediately, there is a high chance of uh, extinction of this species. And uh, there are also some problems with this species is that uh, usually they lay uh, a, or they lay just uh, uh, one a single egg and not every year uh, breeding uh, male and female, they lay just a single egg, even not in every year. The year which is suitable means the year where uh, uh, when they, uh, uh, when they face a uh, sufficient amount of uh, rainfall, although the rainfall is quite quite scarce, even in state of that, that is the when there is a rainfall is uh, about about a suitable amount of rainfall is there, only in those years they actually reproduce. Otherwise, they do not reproduce. That is the problem for their sites. And what are the pro anthropogenic uh, problems? That is the problems created by us. That is mainly the habitat destruction at the same time hunting also. Please go to the next slide. The endangered, that is the, it is not critically endangered, but uh, it has a high risk uh, of extinction in the wild. And uh, maybe in near future, if we cannot take proper action, they can become critically endangered also. The very good example is the red panda. It's uh, only found uh, in the Himalayan region and uh, mainly in the Eastern Himalayan region. And uh, it is uh, also found in Darjeeling from where I belong. And also the Indian hog deer. Once it was uh, widely distributed, even was uh, found in many districts of West Bengal also. But uh, right now they are only restricted in the in few uh, Northeastern hill states. Next slide, please. The vulnerable, okay. But uh, they have a high risk of extinction in the wild. Okay, in medium in uh, medium term of future. Okay, 
the very good example is Saros crane. It is, uh, I think, uh, found in different parts of the North uh, India. Uh, the photograph actually it has been taken in uh, Bharatpur or the Keladu and Ghana National Park. Next slide, please. The near threatened, that is, uh, they are not vulnerable, neither vulnerable nor endangered, but uh, close to qualify for. Means uh, if we cannot take uh, proper actions, very soon they can become vulnerable or endangered. Uh, two examples are there. There is the logger falcon, usually found in the dry regions of the India, and the Malayan giant swedel. It is found in the northeastern hill states, uh, mainly in the Assam, in uh, part of uh, North Bengal, and uh, other northeastern states. Next slide, please. Now, if we consider a single group of animal, okay, a single group of birds, okay, then we can get endangered, critically endangered, okay, and near threatened, okay. Like uh, that is the, there are one, two, three, four, four species of vulture are there, including the Indian vulture and the Bengal vulture, Gips bengalensis, okay. All are critically endangered. While endangered, it is the Egyptian virus, the near threatened, the beard vulture, okay, the scenarios vulture, as well as the Himalayan griffon, and least concern is the griffon vulture. So if we consider the, a single group of words, okay, we can see critically endangered, endangered, near threatened, as well as least concern. Now, why do they become the critically endangered? The One of the major reason, it is the use of the rampant use or indiscriminate use of the diclofenac. Okay, the diclofenac actually interferes into the uh, uric acid uh, metabolism of the birds and uh, that uh, causes the, ultimately the kidney failure of the birds. Although diclofenac has been banned, but uh, still it's uh, another, it's homolog, that is the acyclofenac is still using or still available in the market. And 40% of the acyclofenac, it, is, uh, it can be converted into diclofenac. So the attempts has also been taken to uh, ban the acyclofenac also. Next slide, please. The least concern, that is, it is neither vulnerable nor threatened. Okay, it is widespread and abundant taxa. Okay, they are included in this category. For example, the osprey, they are the widespread winter visitor in uh, India and uh, other uh, and few other uh, states of uh, South and Southeastern Asia. And there are also some Data deficient means the data sufficient data of the population is not available. At the same time, there is no evaluated means this is that they are they are common or uncommon, but they are not means their status are not evaluated yet. Now this is the red uh, list uh, index where we can see there is the both birds, uh, mammals, the corals, amphibians, and uh, cycads. So they have a trend of uh, declining means they are declining means that is the declining not in number but also in species that is the there are chances of many species to become extinct in near future now the extinction risk of the species so that is the iucn report uh, in this year it assessed in each category for the more comprehensive assessed, that is uh, at least 80% of the species of the group has been assessed. That is that group, uh, each group containing more than equal, <coughs> more equal to <coughs> 150 species of animals and other animals and uh, even uh, uh, plants also. Now, this is the summary. So in up to, uh, since uh, 1996, the IUCN red list, they have been, that is the total asset, totally assessed, that is the more than 150,000 species has been assessed. And among these, more than 42,000 are threatened. Now in uh, India, we can see there are about uh, 648 species are there that are considered as uh, threatened. Please go to the next slide. So in India, at least uh, 648 species, they are considered as threatened. That includes the mammals, birds, reptiles, the feces, uh, the crustaceans, and uh, many other invertebrates. Please go to the next slide. 
So this is the summary of uh, different uh, categories of the threatened species in India. Please go to the next slide. Now the major threats of biodiversity, that is the habitat loss and degradation. That is the major threat because as the human population is increasing day by day. So our population, that is the population of human being, it actually creates the major problem in wildlife conservation or conservation of any natural habitat. At the same time, that is the overexploitation due to the increasing demand, okay. It may be uh, due to the uh, demand uh, due to some export or business or just uh, over exploitation due to the increase of the population. Population means that is the population of the human being. Then there is also the alien and invasive species as we, we have seen that is the in our area that is in India, uh, many alien species or invasive species or many uh, foreign species are actually introduced. A uh, very good example that is the Acornia trasipes, that is the water hyacinth that is introduced by the Britishers in the, in the freshwater ecosystem of India. So right now, many parts of the India, I think most of the parts of the India, uh, even in the comparatively high altitude also, I have seen uh, even uh, around uh, 4,000 meter altitude also, the freshwater lakes, everywhere there is water hyacinth. And that creates a major problem because water hyacinth, they create a dense mat on the, um, water surface and that prevent the growth of the phytoplankton. So as the phytoplankton, they're the major, uh, I think they're the producer, that they're the major producer of the ecosystem. If they declines automatically, the zooplankton and the fish level also declines. So water hyacin, they actually uh, created a great problem in all the freshwater ecosystem in India. In uh, hill areas, especially in the Darjeeling Hills, the Cryptomeria japonicum, the, its local name is Dhupi. It was also introduced by the Britishers. But right now, the indigenous pine species, there, there has been almost eradicated in entire Darjeeling district by the invasive species, that is the Dhupi. Its scientific name is the Cryptomeria japonicum that was introduced uh, from Japan into India by the Britishers. Now there are many other disturbances that including that is the eradication of the species, okay, considered uh, to be pest. Uh, means uh, whenever the forests are cleared and agricultural uh, fields are set up there and the wild animals, okay, that has uh, become a refugee, nothing but a refugee, they usually raid the agricultural fields, okay. Uh, frequently, especially during the night, and uh, they are considered as pests and uh, they are deliberately killed by the farmers. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, I was saying that we are over time, and can we just hurry a bit and pack it up because the participants are getting a bit impatient? Okay, okay. So uh, please uh, go to the next slide. Uh, next. Next slide. Next. Next. Yes. So according to one study, India along with the mega diversity countries is the home to about 60 to 70% of the world's biodiversity. And India lying within the Indo-Malayan ecozone, it's home to about 7.6% of the all mammals, 12.6% of the uh, birds. Already you have seen this. Please, uh, already you have discussed all these things. Please go to the next slide. Yes. And uh, that is the poaching. Poaching is also a major threat in India. Next slide. Next. Yes. So that is that we can consider for the awareness and the save the forest and wildlife in India, but there are some problems. Okay. Suppose in the figure we have seen that is a saltwater crocodile. It has been dragged a cow from the village. Okay. The photograph was taken in uh, Vidur Konika. So we can say, yes, wildlife conservation, conservation of natural resources, it is required. But the, at the same time, we must have to diminish the man or must have to, must have to take action to decrease the man wildlife conflict. Uh, please uh, go to the next slide. Uh, to the next. Uh, go to the slide number 113.
Next, please. Next. 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 Yes. Uh, please. Uh, yes, you can stick there. That is a man animal conflict. So, man animal, let's go to the next slide. Manual conflict it is increasing day by day in India, and that is one of the uh, major, uh, I think, threat for conservation of the wild animals. Here we have seen there is a tiger. There is a number of death by, uh, of a human being by tiger. Go to the next slide. Yes, and for elephant, it is the I think the death toll is huge, about five. 86 in 2019-20. Next slide. So that type of uh, things uh, are unfortunate things sometimes occurs. Uh, the wild boar here we, we have seen that is the they causes the damage of for 15 to 40 percent of the crops. Please go to the next slide. While elephant, they may cause 20 to 50% of the crop damage. Next slide. So people uh, uh, who are uh, staying in, uh, close to the forest or close to the area, area where elephants are present, they usually erect the fence. But the elephants, they discover so many ta uh, different tactics to break the fences because they know the elephant task. It is uh, uh, actually, uh, it cannot uh, carry the electricity. So it is actually a non-conductor of the electricity. That's why they use their tasks, sometimes the branches of the trees to break the electric fences. Go to the next slide. Here in the night, at night, in the photograph is taken at the night, there is the two bulls They challenges the electric fence. The next slide, next, next slide, next slide, next slide, yes, this. So in Assam, 90 elephants have been electrocuted to death since 2011, and the figure is more than 100 in West Bengal from 2011 to 2019, okay. So experts say that the lack of punishment, okay, that actually emboldens the people to erect illegal electric fence. Means for the elephant as its surface area, body surface area is quite big or quite large. So that's why a low intensity electric, suppose uh, less than 10 volt is enough to deter it. But instead of using the 10 volt electric current, people uh, usually they use the domestic line. Directly they uh, use or they connect with the domestic line that is the 220 volt. That can cause the death of the elephant, not only elephant, but also many other wild animals. Next. Please uh, go to the slide number 131. Next. 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 Yes. So management strategies with the wild boar. Actually, if uh, castor beans, uh, they are actually planted at a, at a four at a row, four rows, okay, uh, or four thick rows. In that case. The wild boar, they actually, they can be deterred, okay. How? Because uh, the smell of the castor bean, it is uh, actually the wild boar, they dislike the smell of the castor bean. Uh, next, similar, next slide. Similar thing can be uh, done by uh, using the safflower. But the main issue is the shrinking habitat that must has to be arrested. And that is done by creating the wildlife corridors. Go to the next slide. Please go to the next slide. Next. Next slide.
Hello. Hello. Are you there? Yes, 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 I am here. What slide should we be on? Uh, uh, that is the slide number, that is the 135. That is the right of the passage elephants corridors of India. Slide number 135. Can you see my screen? Uh, slide number 135. Uh, no. What's visible on your screen? Uh, uh, why will uh, corridors reduce conflict? It's next slide. Go to the next slide. I can see oh. right of passage elephant corridor of India. The green color yes, map. Yes, yes, yes. Right now, right now it is visible. So these are the maps showing the different elephant corridors. Okay. Although there are about 101 corridors are actually, uh, these uh, 101 corridors uh, that has been proposed, but secured corridors are only six. And uh, there are another six corridors that are being uh, in the process of the secure. Please uh, go to the next slide. Yes, that side uh, shows that uh, there is the already established corridor. There are six, and uh, the corridors uh, that are uh, under process of the construction. There is another six is there. Now, please uh, go to the next to next slide. That is the last uh, slide. After conclusion, yes, next slide. Okay, so in order to enhance protected area effectiveness. Conservation should be based on sound scientific knowledge. At the same time, that is that we must have to involve the local people and we must have to incorporate the knowledge from the indigenous people, okay? And there also must be some awareness in the people for saving animals. And as uh, Mahatma Gandhi accurately said, that is the, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. Thank you. Thank you for the session, sir. Well, and uh, if anybody has any question regarding that, uh, especially yes, I can uh, tell that I have uh, mainly I'm uh, for last uh, 12 years, I've been working on the wetland ecology and uh, mainly on the freshwater ecosystem. Uh, and uh, my Working area is usually in the South Bengal and also a few parts of the North Bengal also. In Northern part of the West Bengal at the same time, Southern part of the West Bengal also. So if anyone has any question regarding that, uh, especially on the wetland birds, the wetland conservation, at the same time, the status of the wetlands, uh, please ask me for the questions. Participants hey can participants can post their questions on the chat box or they can just unmute yourself one by one and ask the questions. Thank you. It seems there are no questions, so can we move on? We'll be moving on and we'll come to the end of the uh, session. Wait, that, there, is, that is one question. Like how, how can we get, how can we make a career in wildlife conservation? 
तो फॉर दिस आई थिंक वी uh yes i think yes. uh in next uh, 28 uh, we have a discussion on this uh but uh, anyway i can uh, give the answer that is that there are so many areas in both in the government and uh, also in the non government sectors uh in uh, wwf uh, in suppose in case of non government uh, organization it is a non government organization but still there are uh, i think uh, many job opportunities there at the same time uh, there are many government jobs are also available in india but uh, that will be uh, discussed uh, i think uh, in detail on uh, most probably on 28th uh, december yes we have a detailed webinar on the same and we will be sharing information about the same here uh, as for the session it was a great one dr prantik hazra and just so i can tell everyone here he had made a 140 slides presentation which we could unfortunately not address because of the time duration um as for the sweet little gift i'll take a moment to present something i request everyone to stay here Hello, am I audible? Vedant, can you tell me, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. No yes, you're audible. audible. Just a second, I'm having some pro problems presenting the screen. No problem. You take it ahead. Just a queries for all the participants since you are asking the for the feedback form for the certificates. We have already mentioned it very well. The team has contacted you for that. When you guys will be attending your paid webinar, that is our next level webinar of this the, of the same topic, then only you will be getting the certificates. We already have your record. We already have your names. so don't worry about that the names has been recorded once you are paid for your paid webinar and you are there you will get the certificate for the same um okay may i carry on ronak yes vedansh you can go ahead okay so basically we have a whole uh, planned out webinar on career guidance and options in wildlife and how to approach it and we just for you guys we have reduced the price twice like it it was 349 and 279 for the uh, regular public but the ones who are uh, here attending the webinar we have made it rupees 249 only till 20th december and just to mention we have limited seats because they are filling in very fast so it's a great it's a great webinar and our certificate courses are uh, professionally designed narrated and streamlined for efficient knowledge we guarantee that you will learn something new it um can you see my screen yes it is yes yes as we are registered with the government the certificates we issue can be used anywhere so even if you have someone in your family who is a student a student of any level you must attend this webinar it will be conduct conducted by dr prantik hazra again and as we see how immense his knowledge is we will get to see it again on 28th so i request everyone to please uh, and to please register for this webinar it's a great career counseling event and thank you that's all from my side over to taku any any doubt anyone <laughs>
Okay, a very good evening, everyone present here. I, Maria Chetiar, interning with Nature's Eye, would like to express my gratitude to all the esteemed delegates of the webinar for their presence and contribution to make this webinar a great success. I, on behalf of Nature's Eye, extend a extend a very hearty vote of thanks to our honorable speaker, Dr. Pratnik Hazre, Assistant Professor, Darjeeling Government College. Darjeeling University for an enlightening and entertaining presentation on the topic, wildlife conservation. We appreciate your efforts for making participants clear on this particular subject. I would also like to thank all the participants for patiently and sincerely attending this session. Finally, on behalf of my team members, I would like to, take, I would like to take this opportunity to, to, to place on record a heartly thanks to the core team of the Nature's Eye and also Ms. Shuli Mukherjee, our team guide, for the perfect logistic support and guidance they have extended to all of us at Nature's Eye to organize this successful webinar. Also extend my thanks to my fellow team members, Tikli, Vedansh, Taku, and Siddharth for their enormous cooperation in the organization for this event. Thank you all for being present here. Uh, surely your voice is not audible. Madam, madam, please hear, repeat this question. When the next session will be held? And the, what is the price of that? Okay, so and the next session is on 28th December. And uh, the special discount price is 249 as visible on your screen. You can see that. So for yes. registration, yes, you yes, can yes. visit you can visit the website or also you can contact the email ID given in this poster. Okay. Please uh, uh, tell me the e-certificates will be provided us. Yes. If you attend this webinar of career guidance, you will be provided yeah. with e-certificates. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Madam, I am from Pakistan. Can I join the next? Uh, yes, of course seminar. you can join. Uh, and the uh, yeah, this is a two forty nine uh, price. This is in Hindi. Hindi rupees two forty nine. Yes, this is in Hindi, English, all languages. Hindi and English, both the languages. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for joining everyone. I request the teammates to stay back and participants. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, see you in our next session. Thank you very much of all the members who joined this meeting.
No, it is just the team members and us. Me. Stop. 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 St